Okay, so let's get started. Um, so this week we're going to be talking about linear programming. But since we're just doing this for one week, we're not going to be able to cover all of the you know, different aspects of linear programming. In particular, we're not even going to learn any methods for solving linear programs, but we're just going to learn some kind of basic kind of facts about them. The things that you know, I want you to take from this week are, so basically, you know, how to set up linear programs. So given a, a problem, how can you formulate it as a linear program? Uh, some basic properties. Um, other things like, you know, how to manipulate linear programs. In other words, basically, how to take a linear program and uh, kind of transform it into a different form. Um, also things like taking the dual of a linear program. And, and also some, you know, some basic things like how to sketch the feasible region for a linear program, but only in, in R2, right? Because it's kind of hard to draw things in higher dimension. Okay, so, um, right, so hopefully there's still something written on this board. Yes, yeah, so I think it's probably the nicest way to start is with a, an example, just to see how linear programs turn up in, in a lot of real world problems. Okay, so, uh, okay, so sorry, I, I wrote this in advance because it, it takes a lot of writing, but uh, you, know, you don't have to write every single word that's on the board. Um, anyway, so here's an example. So suppose you live on a strange island or in a strange place where, where there's only two different types of food, okay? There's only beans or potatoes, okay? And these two different types of foods have different prices and they have different nutritional value, okay? So the, the price of one unit of, of potatoes is 35 pence, okay? So you're on a strange island which apparently uses pounds. Um, and the price of one unit of beans is 60, so, so they have different costs. And the nutritional value and let's say that there's only, I mean, I know that nutrition is more complicated than this, but suppose there's only like three different things you need to eat, right? So you need to get enough carbohydrates, you need to get enough protein and enough vitamins. And uh, so the, the amount of, of these different things that are in potatoes and beans is given as follows. So potatoes have five units of carbohydrates, four of protein, two of vitamins. Beans have seven carbohydrates, two protein, one vitamin. Okay, and... Suppose like a healthy person needs to consume eight units of carbs, 15 of protein, three of vitamins. And now the question, you know, suppose, okay, you, you don't have a lot of money, right? I guess you can, I mean, being students, you can understand that situation, right? So you want to, you want to get enough different nutrition, um, but spending the least amount of money possible. So, so yeah, you need to get fifth, eight of carbs, 15 of protein, three of vitamins. But remember, and remember these things cost different amounts of money and you want to, minimize the amount of money you spend okay, per day. So, so suppose this is what you need per day and you want to minimize your price per day. Okay, so, so this, I think, I mean, it's a kind of natural problem. Now we want to, so we want to find out how much potatoes and how much beans should you buy. Oops. Sorry. So are there any questions about the basic setup of what I'm asking? Okay, so, right. So to solve this mathematically, it's, it's a, you know, useful to come up with some variables. So let x1 be the number or the yeah the number of units of potatoes that you buy per day well and similarly x2 is going to be the number of units of beans that you buy per day okay so then so so the cost is remember so our, our objective function is cost right we want to minimize the cost so so what is the cost so this is going to be our objective function this is the function we're trying to minimize and well okay does anyone want to tell me what the cost yeah right yeah right so just literally taking taking this price per unit and multiplying it by the number of units okay and then okay we're trying to we're trying to minimize cost but we need to you know we have some restrictions on what you what uh what you need right so so the first restriction we have to you know we know that we have to get enough carbohydrates so okay so how much carbohydrates do you get in a day or from one or yeah how much do you get from from buying this amount of these two things, well, so you get uh, from each from each unit of potatoes, you get five units of carbs. From each unit of beans, you get seven units. So this is you know given that you buy this much per day, this is the amount of carbohydrates you get per day, and you need this to be at least eight. So this is this is a constraint coming from the carbohydrates, right? And then you have similar things for proteins. So uh, for protein, you have four from potatoes. Oh, sorry. I think I wanted those the other way around. I think obviously beans has more protein potatoes in real life. But okay, but let's let's just uh, keep it like that. Okay, so two from beans, 
you need that to be at least 15. Uh, vitamins, you get 2x1 plus 1x2 has to be at least 3. Okay. Now there's one, there's, there's two more constraints which maybe aren't obvious that you, you know, that you should put into this, but, but it turns out to be quite important because otherwise you might get a, a really nonsense solution. So one thing is that, you know, you can't buy a negative amount of potatoes and you can't buy a negative amount of So we also need these non-negativity constraints. You know that definitely x1 has to be non-negative and so does x2. And that's important because otherwise, you know, when you solve this problem, you might end up with a nonsense solution saying you should buy negative one, you know, potatoes and 20 beans or something. Okay, so this is, so this basic kind of setup is, uh, is basically what we think of as a, a linear program, right? So a linear program, you, you optimize, so you have, you have, you know, variables, so our variables are x1 and x2, and you, you're kind of optimizing a linear function, so in many variables, so this is a, a linear function um, over linear constraints. So all of these are, are linear constraints, right? It's you know, some constant times the first variable, constant times the second variable, at least some number. So that's what linear program. Any questions so far? Okay, so so one, so now let's just see. Um, so I mean, a linear program, you can just write it in this way. You can write just some sort of linear objective function and just write a bunch of constraints. But there's actually, there's also a kind of more slick way of writing linear program, a kind of succinct way. So. So um, yeah, so here's here's a kind of a more general definition of a linear program. So a linear program, sometimes we'll call it just an LP, uh, is an optimization problem of the following type. So we let capital A be an m by m matrix, m by n matrix over the reals. So, so this this notation means m by n matrix with real entries, right? So, fix some some matrix m by n matrix. Let uh, b be a. Let me just make sure I get this the right way around. Yeah. So, b is an Rm and C is a vector in Rn, and let x1 up to xn be, be variables, and write so so the x is the, the column vector x1 up to xn. Okay. So by the way, one one kind of you know important thing, well possibly important thing, just to kind of it could become confusing if if I don't write this. So. So let me say that these are, when I write r, r to the m, I always mean column vectors. So, so yeah, it could cause some confusion if you think these are rows rather than columns. Whenever I talk about r, n, or r, r to the m, I always mean column vectors. Okay, so, so the, the, uh, the general form of, li of a linear program is, is as follows. So it's you know, max, maximize, or minimize. You can always kind of go between the two by taking negatives. Um, so maximize. This product. Okay. So this is a this is a you know n n by one um, column vector. This is a, a, a another column vector, but here I take the transpose. So this is really just I mean technically this is really just the dot product. You can think of it that way. But so this this equals just just a real number. So it makes sense to maximize it and subject to a x at most b, where so I should, uh, so to be clear, what I mean by this is that, so, so for vectors, so for, for two vectors, let's say an Rm, um, to write u is at most v means that every coordinate of u is at most every coordinate of v for all i. So the, the ith coordinate, so writing this means that you know, this vector completely dominates the other one. Okay, so I claim that you know, all linear programs basically, well, this is basically the, you know, what a linear program is. So let's just check that we can represent the, the example that we looked at in this form. Oh, and by the way, like as usual, so, so a linear program is anything that looks like this, or you can, can replace max with min, or switch 
the, switch the inequality around the other way. Suppose that C looks like this, right? So it's C1, C2, Cn, right? If I take C transpose x, well, that's the same as taking the dot product of C and x. So C transpose x is just going to be C1, x1, plus C2, x2, plus, et cetera, up to Cn, xn. And this is my, this is the, the linear objective function. So this is, this is the function that you're, you're but you can see that whenever, no matter what vector I put here, when you take C transpose x, it always gives you a linear function in the variables, right? It's just a bunch of coefficients times the variables and you add them up, right? And that, and that in our example, is going to be the cost function. Is that, does it make it clear? Any other questions? Okay, cool. Thanks for the, okay. All right, so, so in the example, um, yeah, so like I said, this, uh, the objective function is the cost, right? So it's 0.35x1 times, or plus 0.6x2. So, well, so the vector C is going to be just 0 0.35, 0 0.6, right? Because we're, if you take this times, well, transpose of this times x, that gives you the, your cost function. And so what, and now we kind of, we can figure out what is the, the matrix A and the vector B by looking at the constraints. So, okay, so the way you can read it off is, um, so if you think about what happens when you multiply the, a matrix by a vector, you know, basically what you can do here, you take the coefficients from the first constraint and you can just write them as the first row of the matrix. The, the coefficients from the second constraint just go on, on the second row. We have two, one. And now we also have these non-negativity constraints, right? That x1 and x2 are both non-negative. And you also need to put those into the matrix as well. But that just looks like, so if, if you look at, if you think about it, if you take this matrix times x1, x2, you'll literally get out, you know, you know, 5x1 plus 7x2, you know, 4x1 plus 2x2, and so on. And these are exactly the kind of left-hand sides of these um, constraints. And then the vector B is just going to be um, the right-hand sides of the constraint. So 8, 15, 3, 0, 0. These are for the non-negativity constraint. And the linear program then is just, so, so this turns out to be a minimization problem because it's to do with cost subject to uh, Ax. This time, actually, it, the inequality goes the opposite direction, but this, this is kind of, this doesn't matter. Right? Ax is at least. Any questions about that? Okay. Right, so this is, this is one of the kind of skills that, that I want you to, to get from this is, you know, how to take a problem um, and turn it into a linear, pro, linear program. Uh, and there's, so this is actually kind of relatively easy example, but there's, so there's a, a more complicated example in the uh, exercises. Okay, so. So next, uh, we need some definitions. So, okay, so, so given a linear program, given it an LP of the form, it's terrible. So just, you know, the standard kind of form that we started with, um, the set, the set of all x which satisfy the constraint, well, um, actually, sorry, let me take this back. Um, a vector x is feasible for the linear program if it satisfies the constraint. So if Ax is indeed at most B. So those are the kind of, basically the feasible points are the things that we are doing the optimization over. Um, okay, and another definition. Um, so this, you know, an LP of this type. Um, so the LP is bound, or let's say unbounded, if basically the objective function can be made as large as you like. So, so if the maximum is actually infinity. So if uh, for all M, there exists feasible, a feasible point x such that the, um, such that the object objective function goes above it to that, to that point. And okay, if it was a minimization problem, it would be unbounded if you can make it as negative as you. So if, if, the, if the minimum is negative infinity, right? So that's, that's similar. And otherwise, it is bounded. <clears throat> and now just two kind of definitions which can help us think about linear programs kind of geometrically. Um, so, uh, so the set of feasible points for a linear program is called um, something called a polytope. Actually, may, I need to make sure I get these the right way. Around. So, ah, uh, yeah. So I actually got it the wrong way. Around. So, okay. So, given you know a matrix A and a vector B, so the set of all basically the set of all feasible points for a for a linear program. So the set of all x such that A x is at most B is called polyhedron. No, this seems okay. Well. This is what it says in my notes. It might be the, so there's two different words, polyhedron and polytope. They might be the other way around. Um, I'll let you know next time if, if, I was, if that was they are. Uh, so, 
So a bounded polyhedron is called a polytope. Now let me kind of explain what, what I mean by this, what, what these things look like um, geometrically. So, um, okay, so, and okay, this is, one thing is like, you know, it's hard to kind of visualize things in, in dimensions higher than maybe two or three, right? Uh, so, so whenever I ask you to sketch a, a polytope or a polyhedron, it's always going to be, you know, in, probably in dimension two, right? Um, but so here's, here's an example of how, do you, how you sketch uh, a polyhedron. So, so consider the constraints negative x1 plus x2 is at most 2, uh, 2x2 plus 4x1 most 10, x1 at least 0, x2 at least 1. So this is a set of linear constraints. <clears throat> and if I wanted to plot the feasible points, so, so I you know, draw my coordinates, I have an x1 axis and an x2 axis. Um, and yeah, so this is, this is not terribly difficult, right? So, so you know, this I can write as x2 is at most x1 plus 2. So that's, so basically I can take this line going up with slope 1, right? And it says x2 is at most x1 plus 2, right? So I, I take the bottom half of this. So that's the set of points that are feasible for the first thing. Uh, for the second one, this is the same as x2 is at most 2x1, sorry, minus 2x1 plus so, or sorry, plus five. Um, anyway, so this this is going to look like I don't know something like this. X two is you know we're going to take this side of it. We have x one is at least zero. So that's like you take this line, you take this side of it, and x one x two is at least one. So that means you take above this. So at, in the end, your feasible region is this thing here. If I've done it correctly. Any questions about that? Okay. So right. So one thing is well, if you remember from like the very first lecture, you know I I kind of you know what I said to you was that. Uh, combinatorial optimization is about you know optimizing objective functions over a finite set of points over so your d your domain is usually finite this doesn't look very finite right i mean obviously there are uncountably many points you know there's certainly infinitely many points inside this feasible region so it would seem like i sort of lied to you right cuz cuz here we're talking about now optimizing over a uh, an infinite set of points but it turns out so one of the the nice things about linear programs is even though the optimization is technically over an infinite number of points, you can always um, kind of transform it into a problem that only needs to think about finitely many points. <clears throat> Actually, does anyone already know what, what points are going to be the, the ones we need to care about in linear programs? Like a, a succinct word for them, sorry? Yeah, yeah, so, so I think the word was vertices. I'll call them corners. So but basically, if you look at that picture, I mean, there's kind of, you have this, this shape that you get, this, um, this polytope, which you get by kind of taking these constraints and, and using them to cut up, well, to cut up a region of, of the plane, or generally a region of R to the N, and that thing is going to have some corners on it, right? Because every time we took a constraint, we took a line, basically, and cut up the, uh, the shape. And so, and basically, you know, in order to, to solve a linear program, so the, the optimum always occurs on one of the corners, okay? So this is something, I'm not going to prove this formally, but I'll give you a little bit of intuition about one reason why, why it's true. So, so, uh, so, for, so technically, I need to talk about a bounded linear program because if it's unbounded, there's actually no optimum at all, right? Because you, you can make it arbitrarily large. So I have to say, so for a bounded linear program is, well, I should actually rephrase, rephrase this. So the fact that I'm saying the kind of suggests that there's only one. So there can actually be you know, infinitely many optimum points. Um, so I'm actually going to, apologies if, if you've already written half of that sentence, but I need to, to be a bit careful. So um, for every bounded in your program, there exists a, a so I'm not even being that, that's, you know, I'm not being, extremely uh, cl you know, clear what I mean by corner, but you can kind of see in the picture. So of the feasible region, which is optimal. And like uh, you know, somebody said, sometimes these corners you can call vertices, so a vertex. Okay, so these words are kind of interchangeable. Um, here's a quick. So, this, so like I said, I'm not going to give like a rigorous proof of this, but here's a quick kind of reason why it might be true. Um, and this is, comes from kind of what you know in calculus. So, so kind of, so there's, there's lots of ways you can prove this, but a kind of proof idea. 
So if I so so you know in calculus, suppose I take some kind of region in the plane, and I have a I have some function f on this region. So so suppose you're trying to maximize a function over something some some sort of closed say compact region or something in the plane. So and let's say f is differentiable, meaning well yeah so. In particular, the partial derivatives exist, right? So this is a function of two variables, x1, x2. So if you want to maximize this, find a, if you want to find all the local maxima, maxima, you know, what would you do? So you take the partial derivatives, you set them equal to zero. Like, so, you know, the maxima ha have to occur on, you know, either they occur in the interior on a critical point, so somewhere where the partial derivatives are zero, or they occur somewhere on the boundary. So, so the local max maxima either occur somewhere in the interior on a critical point or somewhere on the boundary, right? And that's the same as, okay, I mean, the kind of one-dimensional analog is if you have, right, you might, if you don't remember this sort of thing, you might remember this, right? So if you have a function from an interval to the reals, either the, the maxima are somewhere in the, in the interior on a critical point where the derivative is zero, or it's actually at A or it's at B. You have to check these possibilities. If you, but if you take a linear function, right, because here our objective function is always linear. If you take a linear function, suppose f is just, you know, um, c1, x1 plus c2, x2. So these are, these are just constants. x1 and x2 are variables. And you take the uh, partial derivatives, well, it's just c1, right? The first partial derivative. And the second one's just c2, right? So, so basically, like, the gradient is, is never going to be, okay, so is, if, uh, if c1, if this, if your constants aren't just kind of boring, if they're not just both zero, then um, and you look at you look at your kind of polytope, you know, so just think of it in, in R two, you know, you, you don't have any critical points, right? So there's there's no place where the derivative where the both partial derivatives are, are zero on the interior, right? Because simply your partial derivatives are just constants, right? So the the only option is that your your maximum or minimum must be somewhere on the boundary. Okay, that's not quite the same as saying it's on the corner. But now think of the boundary, right? So take, take this line segment. And suppose I want to find the maximum that occurs on this line segment. Well, now it's just a similar sort of problem, except now it's a one-dimensional problem. So can the, you can kind of take your, you know, figure out are the critical points in the interior of this? Well, the answer is no again. So then therefore, your maximum value on this interval must be either this endpoint or this one. And you can do that for all of the different line segments. And then you know that it must be a corner. So, so this kind of picture is just in two dimensions. But I think you can kind of see that the same thing should happen in higher dimensions as well. Right? So basically, one reason for this is just calculus. Okay, you can also prove it directly without using any calculus. But, but this should be a sort of idea that you're familiar with. OK, so, so, so everything comes down to just finding uh, which corner of the polytope maximizes or minimizes the objective function. And you know. Uh, a polytope only has finitely many corners, so now this is really a finite problem. Yeah. Any questions about any of that? But, uh, but something you can keep in mind, so this was an incredibly important result in the theory, is that um, linear programs can be solved in polynomial time. That's a result of Cachian. Um, one, one kind of uh, you know, not obvious thing is what do I even mean by polynomial time, right? So polynomial time, so it's polynomial in both the parameters n and m, right? So n, remember, n is the number of variables, right? x1, we have variables x1 up to xn. And remember what m was, so um, m is the number of constraints. Okay, so, so the message here from this theorem, if you, can, if you can transform an optimization problem into an equivalent in your program, uh, well, well, OK, technically, with, uh, with the number of variables and constraints um, at most polynomial in the size of the original problem, then you get a, you get a polynomial algorithm for the original problem. Right? Because you can, just, you can take your problem, transform it into a linear program. OK, so one technical thing is you, you need to keep the number of variables and constraints not too large. Otherwise, you, know, otherwise you have a problem. But uh, so then the original problem can be solved efficiently, meaning in polynomial time. So that's, you know, um, so whenever you kind of take a problem and you transform it into a linear program, usually you're pretty happy because now you can, you can find the solution polynomial time. Okay, so basically done with everything I wanted to say today. Let me just check. Um, okay, 
yeah, so that's, that's really all I wanted to say. Any, but it, before you go, any, any questions on anything today? Okay, so see you, see you tomorrow. <laughs>